Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our Urban Living Light session this afternoon. That's all about sustainability and urban development. Um, delighted to have my panel with me. Let me tell you a bit about the series. The Urban Light, uh, Urban Living Light, is a series of eight online sessions this week. They were really a precursor to the uh, Urban Living Festival, which is a new event which is taking place at Tobacco Dock in London, July the 7th and 8th this year. So this is really a, a, a great run up to that event. The link to the event is in the chat, so uh, do have a look. The festival is really based around three stages, live, work and stay. And we'll focus on the increasing convergence that we're seeing between numerous hospitality and real estate asset classes, the real blurring that we're seeing happening there. Um, particular thanks for this series, this uh, Urban Living Light series to Yardi, who sponsored uh, this week. They've provided a short video to outline who they are and what they offer to the real estate industry. Thank you very much, Yardi. Lots of familiar themes we will all see in there. So listen, uh, the usual webinar rules apply. All attendees will be on mute throughout, but please do use the Q&A and the chat function on the side to ask any questions to the panelists and we'll get, make sure those get asked throughout the session. Um, yes, for those of you wondering, there will indeed be a recording that will be sent out tomorrow to all of those who've registered. So let's get on with it. Let's uh, like to welcome everybody. Let me introduce myself. Uh, I am Catherine Lecane and I am Managing Director at Hokuso. Uh, I guess we describe ourselves as hands-on advisors to owners, operators, governments and funds in real estate and hospitality. Um, we really like to roll up our sleeves and we're into helping create the next generation of solutions in areas that are undergoing extreme disruption and change. Very familiar themes for all of us, I know. Let me hand you over to uh, my panel of experts. They're real people of action. And I'd like to invite them to introduce uh, themselves very briefly. Let me start with you, Ufi, please. Hello everyone, I'm Ufi Ibrahim. I am the Chief Executive of the Energy and Environment Alliance. We're a not-for-profit organization helping to transition hotels and service departments to net carbon zero. Ufi, thank you and welcome. Matt, let me hand over to you. Hi, my name is Matt Morley. Uh, I advise on wellbeing, sustainability and interiors for the real estate, hospitality and leisure sectors. My background's in the creative side of real estate development and I combine that with green building and wellness expertise. So those are, if you like, the three points to my triangle. I have my own business called Biophilico that does essentially well-being and wellness for, for real estate and interiors. And another business called Biofit that advises on gyms and fitness concepts for hotels and residential developers. Thank you, Matt. Dr. Stefan Plesser, please, over to you. 
Yes, hello. My name is Stefan Plesser. I'm Managing Director of Cinevision. We are a, a German software company and we are specialized in uh, quality management, digital quality management for buildings. So we support owners, uh, investors, asset managers by implementing uh, a quality management strategy for their assets, helping them uh, to get buildings work the way they are supposed to work, which is quite a challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. And Peter. Peter, you're on mute. Thanks for the reminder. There you are. Um, thanks, Catherine. Um, I've got a background in international consultancy on sustainable development and infrastructure, starting really with design engineering, then through to management consultancy. Now I'm a, a specialist advisor on solutions for infrastructure, uh, urban development. And I work uh, government ministry level with business uh, and with um, the industry on practical solutions. So I basically turn strategy into delivery. Super, thanks, Peter. And Sophie. Hi, I'm Sophie Carruth. I'm the European Head of Sustainability for LaSalle Investment Management. Uh, we're a global real estate investment management company with $65 billion um, of assets under management globally. Um, I'm responsible for really um, embedding or implementing our sustainability strategy. And we focus on four pillars, which are climate change, responsible consumption, rewilding and social value. And we're really looking to embed each of those pillars into every stage of the asset life cycle. Super, thanks Sophie. So welcome everybody. Um, let's get down to business. It's a huge topic, right? So we're gonna just set a few parameters, I think in place uh, to, to essentially direct our conversation this afternoon. Sustainability in the built environment. What do we actually mean by it? What, what are the parameters for our discussion? I'm gonna ask Sophie actually to kick off with this one. Yeah, sure, thanks Catherine. So, I mean, there are plenty of different definitions for sustainability, but let's keep it simple and say it's about people and planet as well as profit. So what does that mean for the built environment? I think there's, there's really two sides to it, but you know, it means improving the relationship between buildings and the environment. So that's reducing the negative impacts that buildings have on it, but also increasing the positive effects that it can have. Um, and then on the social side of things, um, given that people spend about 90% of their time indoors, it's really important that buildings have a positive impact on the people who occupy and interact with them. Um, and, and then there's one issue that's so critical that I really need to highlight it, and that's climate change. Uh, given that buildings emit approximately 40% of global carbon emissions, they're clearly a huge contributor to the issue, but they're also um, significantly affected by the physical impacts of climate change. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, so the physical impacts being things like flooding or extreme heat, uh, extreme cold, storm, that sort of thing. And uh, so whilst sustainability um, in general and climate change in particular can present a number of risks, I think overall there's also plenty of great sustainability opportunities out there for the built environment. If we do a little bit of, thanks Sophie, if, if we do a little bit of um, uh, scene setting maybe around this, because I think, uh, as you say, this link between buildings and the environment, um, the, the discussion around sustain, sustainability that is yeah, very much a priority on the boardroom table. In terms of the enablers for that and how we push that to Bait onto the next level. Can we talk a little bit around that? Ufi, coming at it as you do from establishing uh, essentially a new not-for-profit organization, what do you see are the real critical enablers in, in pushing this agenda? Well, we have come a long way since the 1992 Rio summit. So, you know, at that time, climate change concerns were wholly and solely driven by the scientists and the concerned citizens, if you like, the impact organizations. 
And then we saw the big international institutions, the United Nations, the IPCC, and others come into the fray. Today, that's trickled down to national governments. Um, you know, the Paris Agreement in, uh, in COP, the last uh, COP in uh, Paris was very significant to that effect. And let's not forget that here in the United Kingdom in November, we will see the um, COP26 bring even stronger um, national commitments delivered by many countries around the world. And in fact, those countries have already started to submit those heightened, um, if you like, targets to, to the COP establishment. So that's all coming through. And that has trickled down to the investment community. So certainly investment um, institutional investors and the boards of the institutional investors have started to take proxy action. So all of that is happening. What is still a little slow at the moment, but it's certainly coming, is for that to trickle down into greater regulation and greater action by institutional investors in terms of taking action, not just on the big BPs of this world and the Exxons of this world, which get good PR headlines, but really trickling down into every single investment decision taken by the company. It's coming, but we're not quite there yet. Nevertheless, all of this has resulted in an explosion of ambitious declarations by companies, strategies, targets being issued by, by, by businesses um, in the built environment, certification programs, even eco-conscious brands, sustainability reports, and all of that is to be welcomed. However, this sudden explosion has also created a vacuum in which it's not always easy to distinguish good from poor practice, and evidence-based reporting from greenwash. Understood, Ufi. And I think um, if, if we look at what is happening, as you say, on, a, uh, on an urban level, whether it's in, in legislation or um, from an investor's perspective, Peter, perhaps you could uh, draw a a little bit of colour around how it's impacting from an uh, you know, urban planning, from a structural perspective, and what are you seeing in your work? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, well, I think the first thing to say is that the real shift has come. There's been a huge amount of emphasis on sustainability around um, organisations and building at the building level. And I think what we've seen is that we're fast pushing the limits of what can be achieved perhaps just at the scale of the building. And really in parallel with the great work that is being done in that area, um, there is a realization that the problem can sit sometimes outside the red line boundary of the particular building. We need to really think and tackle this at the scale of cities, city regions, and we need to factor in infrastructure, public spaces, economic infrastructure, and so on. And I think it's that level where I see kind of real, real hope. So I think there's been a lot of inertia because cities and buildings are so difficult, so diverse. Uh, you have on the one hand, you know, the brand new vision of the new city, the Mazdas and the JPs in India and so on, start with a blank sheet of paper and throw technology investment and ideas. And you get these showcase exemplars of standalone sustainable cities. That's certainly one vision, but then you've got the rapidly transitioning cities, those cities in South America that are gonna double in size, that are made up of new bits and old bits. And the metro regions around the world are about 2% of the land area, but they generate 80% of the world's wealth. And we're seeing now in places like the developing economies where limits to energy, uh, pollution, congestion, and so on are real breaks on investment and growth and well-being and social progress. So I think what I'm seeing is sort of really a, a kind of a convergence, you know, where the efforts of largely private sector is beginning to sort of dovetail much better with what I'd call strategic planning and the policy initiatives. I mean, one good example, two good examples would be, we just had the um, 10th version of the London plan published recently. So that's a really excellent example of a comprehensive wide view of how London should grow strategically, addressing all these air quality issues, power, where the development, the opportunity zones, what areas will get prioritized, what role 
public transport will play in linking and connecting these things? How would you create investment opportunities for smart city digital technologies programs and so on? So at one level, it's sort of setting a vision and I'm glad to see that the budget yesterday also talked quite interestingly about the infrastructure bank and sovereign green bonds and so on and so forth. And we've seen the leveling up agenda. So that's a kind of a positive. Um, but then on the other level, I would see bringing those big principles back down to the scale of the building. I'd reference Venlo. I don't know if any of you are aware of that in, um, in uh, the Netherlands, but it's basically an economic vision around regeneration, cradle to cradle, um, set out by Bill McDonough and Baumgart and kind of worked on that. But that's really sort of the principles of circular economy applied to, focused on the town hall, whereby they account for the future value of material in the bidding process to actually build and construct the, um, the, the town hall. So there's some real innovation there and that, that drives through certification that straddles buildings and businesses on cradle to cradle, uh, for instance, be the first cradle to cradle region. Um, and we're seeing an awful lot of movement now in, in smart cities, investment in lightning and so on. These things are almost not apparent to citizens, but you've got to think about the smart oyster card. You've got to think about facial recognition systems. You've got to think about mobile and e-commerce, whole urban logistics that are beginning to change the way we operate. So I would say, the future to me looks really interesting because for the first time, the, the divergences that we've seen seem to be aligning. Uh, of course, it, it will not be easy because of its diverse nature, but we've got to apply those principles at the scale of the city and think about systems thinking for long-term sustainability. So there's a really holistic, in other words, what you're saying is that holistic view is is there i guess the big question is around implementation of that right and and as you're talking yeah. about the sort of and it's and that. it's and you will see that at the scale of the corporate campus or the university where you can actually apply the the model down to those scales but i think now we're beginning to see more of those uh, coming together and linking together. So I think over time, it will be a time play for how you change old legacy cities in, in Northern Europe. It will take time, but I, I think the thinking is there. Really interesting, Peter. So if we if we drill down a bit from that holistic level and come back to sort of saying, well, what are investors uh, needing to do, what are investors looking at? Ufi, you touched on, on it in, in what EEA does. Um, Sophie, you're essentially investing uh, money as an organization on behalf of, of um, investors. What, how is the sustainability debate coming into that? It's been so fascinating to track this over the last sort of decade where initially investors were asking if we had a sustainability policy in place and then they might have asked us what that policy included and now it's completely normal and expected for a, an investor to ask us what our strategy is for delivering net zero carbon. I mean it's absolutely exploded in the last couple of years and even I'd say in the last six months it's, it's um, really escalated and it just really demonstrates quite how um, crucial a topic this is and how high up the agenda it is and I think really it comes down to there are as discussed all of those regulatory drivers and and I mean most of our clients are institutional investors so I expect they're getting questions also from their you know the the pension members who want to ensure that their money their pension funds are being invested for good I think I think that's part of it it's also then a, a, a huge risk management piece so uh, the investors fully understand stranded asset risk and again just coming back to the, the climate change issue they absolutely want to ensure that they're invested in assets that uh, are going to be able to stand the test of time and if they're not future proof now that there's a plan in place to ensure that they don't fall behind and indeed identifying which assets it's not possible to bring in line with, for example, the decarbonisation pathway that might be required to get to net zero carbon by 2050. You know, early identification of problem assets will mean that, that you know, investors will be looking to, to 
ensure there's a strategy for disposing of those before it becomes an issue. So it's it's fully embedded in investor thinking, and uh, and I think there's still there's still some way to go, but it's um it's yeah very much on the table and, and very much a, a, a crucial part of their decision making. And, and then so on, on that basis, Sophie, then I guess it, we take it to that next level, which is uh, how do how does one provide investors with that uh, reassurance that uh, those requirements are being met? How do you measure it? Um, there's obviously a whole range of different methods, uh, different certifications out there. Um, uh, I'd like to talk to um, Ufi and, and, and Steph, I'd like to bring you in at this point because I think this is an area that we've we've discussed in the past. Um, talk, talk to us a little bit around this, this the, the, the need to measure, the need essentially to audit, if you like, buildings and people's ability to uh, to put those sustainability measures in place. Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, well, when you, um, when I look back at the, at, the, at the building industry over the last maybe 30 or 40 years, uh, until maybe the 90s, energy, CO2 emissions, et cetera, were simply not an issue. Um, then it started to, you know, uh, Ufi mentioned that 92 uh, started to become an issue, but more in terms of green intentions. Uh, of course, there have been improvements, but it was more on the attentions part. Um, now we have the, um, the, the, the sudden situation that we are really getting serious and green intentions are not enough um, and you really have to deliver green. And suddenly all those, those uh, technical issues that did not matter in detail probably become very, very important. And, and we see this really as a cultural, um, a cultural uh, change in the building industry. Uh, quality, that, which is our core issue, we think it's, it's going to be much more important in the future, uh, really becomes a very, very important aspect now. Quality in, in meaning that a system or a building or whatever actually delivers what it's supposed to deliver. Uh, this is not the case with buildings right now. And when we see what uh, uh, my, my colleagues in the panel already mentioned, we have to do, we have to apply more sophisticated technology. We have to enlarge the scope from the building to the, to the city. Uh, we have more aspects and we have to speed up. This is all a huge, challenge to quality, to getting it done right. Uh, so we think uh, that it's a, it's a very, very big challenge to, um, to actually make use of what we are theoretically able to do. And this will require a change in, um, in the building industry that is, that is uh, tremendous. The good thing is it's not about you know, calculating what the building could do, but every single building will have a, let's say a CO2 meter and the truth will be out. We, we have still, you know, those, those lighthouse buildings, demonstration buildings from the nineties uh, that until now did not publish their CO2 emissions. They claim to be eco, high rise, whatever. They have no numbers. And Ufi mentioned that it's going to be about numbers. It's going to be clear, transparent and tough this is going to be a huge change in the industry and uh, quality management will be one big part in that. Should I um, add to, um, obviously I agree with what um, Stefan has said. I mean, if, I think looking at it from our industry's perspective, so we represent the accommodation sector, the hotels and service departments. From our um, perspective, I think, the question isn't whether or not one should invest in sustainability and whether or not one should embed sustainability across their entire business and their entire value chain. That's not the question. Everybody, I think, now understands it's, they're going to have to do it. The question is how to do it. How? Because it's a very complex, very technical um, you know, undertaking. And so that's the part, I think, which is creating or perhaps slowing progress that, um, as far as we are seeing it today. And the second aspect is when, when to make the investment. 
Should one wait for regulation? Should one wait for that pressure to come from the investors? Or the lenders, we haven't talked about the lenders as well. You know, the lenders are saying that they're going to start applying brown discounts to buildings that, um, that fall short of, um, of climate and change requirements or green premiums added to um, asset values where the assets are, are um, meeting or exceeding those, those environmental and social governance issues, those ESG targets. So it's about, it's about how and when. And that's where um, you know, the, the requirement for um, standards that one can say are scientifically robust and are evidence-based and independently vetted starts to add a certain level of credibility that can stand up to scrutiny. At the moment, what we have within this explosion of uh, businesses and others who have suddenly jumped onto the sustainability bandwagon is that everybody's doing great work, but they're all doing their own thing. And it's very difficult. You cannot benchmark it at the moment. Take, for example, a very simple fact for our industry. There is no standard metric for measuring floor area in our industry, in our built environment. It, I mean, it's, it's, it's remarkable, I think, but it's a reality because at the moment, many um, areas that are being measured for floor area in buildings don't include the outdoor spaces, for example. Um, and that's if you know what your internal floor area is, which you know many don't. So we are having to start from the very basics to define and create that robust system that will stand up to scrutiny, that will stand up to transparency. Because if we don't do that, the um, attention that we have, the spotlight is definitely on the built environment at the moment in terms of ESG, will quickly expose the, the gaps between where we should be and where we are. And you know, 2025, 2030, these are the, the sort of the, the first big timelines that have been set through these big statements that have been made about cutting carbon emissions by 50% by 2025. Whitbread made that commitment years ago, um, or 2030. You know, that, that timeline is going to come on us pretty fast. So how and when, these are the two questions which um, our businesses are asking themselves at the moment. And it's, it's not easy. And that's why there is a requirement for experts and alliances like ours and others to really come together as a collective because collectively we're embarking on a journey that we've not taken before. Yeah, absolutely, Bufi, I think. And as you say, it's the, it's the, it will be a combined impact, won't it, of uh, legislation, of uh, political will, of actually private enterprise will and so on. Matt, I, can we come on to, to looking at sort of flipping things around a little bit and actually seeing what's going on, if you like, at the coal face in terms of design and in, in terms of the sort of changes we're seeing in buildings um, and, and what's driving that? What are you seeing in your business? Yeah, so just sort of place that within perspective then, you know, by the time a project comes to me, there has been a decision taken at some level within an organization that, that they need to make a shift towards greener and healthier uh, real estate, be that commercial or resi. I have to say, I think it's the commercial real estate sector that is leading the way on this, but I think the resi uh, sector is now going along and suddenly actually doing some really interesting things. So, you know, in the past, it's been very much focusing, you know, the priorities have really been around water efficiency, energy efficiency, waste management, transportation, and the impact of transportation to and from a building, and then the materials, uh, both at the construction and fit out level. I think what I'm seeing is, while well, that remains the, the foundation of this whole approach towards green and healthy buildings, there's a slightly wider angle taken now, whereby there's also consideration, perhaps more to uh, the experiential level itself and beyond into facility to ma facilities management as well. So also thinking about things like lighting, access to natural light, uh, indoor air quality that suddenly, for obvious reasons, become a hugely uh, important factor within that. But it's been part of the healthy building movement for, for a long, long time, but has now suddenly become uh, much more urgent. Uh, and within that, also things like active design, promoting stairway use rather than escalators, 
uh, biophilia, access to nature and integrating green spaces even within a building or adjacent to a building. And a final piece that's very much um, really happened over the last year, which has also been a, a greater consideration for uh, the community around a building. So also thinking about that social equity angle on how a building can give back to or support the local community at the same time. So it's a really, really interesting time for, for all of this. There's just so much movement happening. But as I say, it is commercial office space that's leading the way. And now I think sort of the co some of the co-living brands uh, are also doing interesting work in that space. So yeah, it's, uh, it's an interesting time. Thanks, Matt. Um, Sophie, what, what are you seeing if we come back to from a, a real estate uh, and uh, aspect, and particularly in the commercial side, then picking up on Matt's point, what are you seeing? Is it, is it, is it energy driven? Is it where, where's the, where's the real focus of the sustainability um, initiative? So, I mean, uh, similarly, it's definitely started off with energy, carbon, water and waste. We started off tracking environmental performance. But in the last few years, health and well-being has really gone up the agenda as well. And I think, you know, the last 12 months has, has only gone and um, reinforced the message that occupiers of any sort of building do really care about the human experience and want to ensure that the, the people who are using that building, whether it's shoppers within a shopping centre, whether it, you know, whether it's um, office workers in an office building, uh, people living in a residential building, staying in a hotel, whatever the asset type, it's really important that, the, that the, the humans are having a positive experience within that building and the building can have a big impact on it. And I think, um, you know, we've talked quite a lot about the enablers and the drivers for this, but that demand for a certain quality of space, space that is performing in a certain way, that is coming through uh, Ufi mentioned green premiums and brown discounts. It's not always obvious that you're going to necessarily receive a higher rent for a building that's delivering these things right now, but it certainly makes them considerably more attractive to occupiers. So, so there's a, you know, one of the drivers we haven't yet talked about is is the, the kind of the market itself that what you know it's it's actually better better business to be delivering buildings that are more sustainable, and, and that's hard to prove but is definitely there. And I think that growing legislation and the, the tenant demand, the occupier demand, the investor demand, all of those things just layer on top of each other to make it become good business. And that it becomes easier to make the business case for investing the additional capex that might be required to improve buildings across those various different factors that we've talked about already. Yeah, absolutely. And essentially extending the life cycle of these things and future, yeah, future proofing. proofing. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> real, real debate. Ufi, when you're talking to the uh, owners and operators in the hotel, hotel industry, uh, where, does they, where do they see the opportunity? Where do they see the, uh, the challenge, if you like? Well, I, I think that um, the first thing to say is in, in the United Kingdom, data is available. It's not available, um, you know, in across all countries that we've looked at readily. But in the UK, just take energy use, for example. In the United, the United Kingdom government has been tracking energy use by each sector of the economy since 1990. And if you look at that data, you will see that energy use across the UK um, PLC has declined by 20% per year over the past 20 years. While in our industry, in the accommodation sector, energy use has actually increased by 47% over the same period. And while the UK economy has actually increased renewable energy usage, our sector has increased the use of fossil fuels over the same period. And if you look at energy intensity, which means basically the amount of energy that a business or a sector is using to create one unit of economic output, the UK economy has seen energy intensity decline by 53% since 1990. So they're using 53% less energy to create the same level of economic output. It's only three sectors in the economy that have failed to do that. 
that are using more energy to create the same level of economic output. That's mining, quarrying, construction, and our industry, the accommodation sector. So in terms of where the industry's focus should be, and the, the case, the business case for actually focusing on energy, it's CO2 emissions. The amount of energy waste has been, um, you know, put to a figure of around 660,000 tonnes of CO2 emissions that could be saved through simply behavioural changes without actually having to put any capex into the building at all. And that's equivalent to about 270 million pounds per year. So the financial case, the business case is there. It's already there. The data exists in the UK. So when we present that to businesses, what we find is again, the question is around how, and the question is around when, when should they make that investment? And we have to be mindful of the financial realities facing the industry at this time. We haven't talked much around the financial aspects of sustainability. Profitability is a key pillar of sustainability. It must be. So we have to be mindful of that. So for us as an organization, we are trying to ensure that profitability is part of the offer in, and part of the journey to sustainability. It's not just a promise that you're going to be more profitable later on once you've made all this investment. The question is how can we reduce costs significantly now to enable that journey to actually take place and actually take place sooner rather than later. So rather than waiting for that opportune moment to, to, you know, to invest that capex. <laughs> I think one of the keys is finding ways to ensure that it's already profitable to do so in the interim period. So that's where we're focused our um, attention at the moment in terms of the discussion around business case with, uh, with um, hotel and service department properties. And just to say a lot of service departments and hotels have made investments. And you see fantastic eco-conscious brands emerging, for example, or each business already has an asset that they put forward to say, look at the great work we're doing on sustainability. The, the, the challenge is ensuring that that's going to happen across all their properties, not just the new builds, but retrofitting and refurbishing. And that's where it becomes technically challenging. That's where you start um, coming across perhaps planning regulation issues, listed buildings in, in you know, European capital cities, major problem that you have to find an innovative way around. So um, there are challenges, but the opportunities and the financial savings, as I said, are significant. But as you say, Ufi, I mean, we also in the hotel industry, uh, aligning the different stakeholders is is pretty critical in all of this. And when you actually have a, a, a different owner to the equivalent of the occupier, right, your operator, you've essentially got multiple stakeholders in here that need to all be on board with the same thing. So it is indeed a challenge. Stefan, you, you have talked about the importance of contractability when we look at um, in terms of pushing the agenda further forward and tools that perhaps might um, it, it future proof in, it, it increase the value of an asset. I think the, uh, it's, it's extremely important that this, this uh, Nufi mentioned that this technical complexity uh, becomes manageable. Um, and when we look at the building industry, the building industry is pretty special. It's, it's highly fragmented. We have lots of buildings, a huge number of buildings. Um, it is extremely important that those, those measures um, and the corresponding quality management services are contractable. All this happens in contracts. And uh, as long as those uh, processes are not uh, contractable, they, we will have a loose end here. Um, we will have a lot of investments and uh, we will probably not meet our, our objectives. We'll do the investment, but we will find out that it's not working the way it's supposed to work. So we need to become very transparent um, we need to work evidence-based. That is extremely important. Intentions are not, not good enough. Um, and all this has to be uh, so precisely and robustly uh, set up that you can actually put it in any single contract. We need, and this is something that it's, it's really a kind of a mind change. You have to you think of this as being part of every contract for every single building. 
This is not the one big thing, you know, where you show how you could do it, but it's going to be every building. Uh, so this is going to change everything. Um, and, and this is why we call it a cultural change. And when we talk to big asset managers, we tell them don't start with, you know, installing sensors somewhere. <laughs> start to think about quality management before. And then you tell them, okay, well, but you have about 500 of your assets. Okay, if you install 100 meters in every single of those 500 buildings, you have 50,000 meters. The, the sheer scale of doing this, implementing this, managing this, et cetera, et cetera, is a different, a different way of handling buildings. Uh, so that's what, what we, uh, why we consider quality management such a different, uh, yeah, a different mindset, a different way of actually working with buildings. Um, and you cannot do it without uh, shaping it in a way that it actually feeds into regular uh, construction contracts, design contracts, service level agreements for facilities management, etc. It must to be, you must be able to encapsulate this complexity into a contractable shape. That is important. Absolutely understood. So essentially, contractability, the ability to to properly benchmark. Uh, Peter, opportunities, things that get you really excited about what is pushing forward this agenda. If you were to summarize it with one particular thing you've seen recently, what would it be? And I'll, I'll go around to all of the panelists just to say what is it that gets you excited about it. I think I think it's good. for me it's got to be really the um, the role of technology and digital transformation um, and we mentioned cost um, and clearly the capex budgets on buildings you know the ME systems will have a 12 15 year lifespan the building will have an institutional life in terms of a pension fund how they'll view it but the actual building itself will last an awful lot longer than that you know 100 years uh, or or plus so the thing that I see is rather than kind of putting more and more complexity into construction and into buildings, the possibilities that we have through digital, mobile and technology solutions kind of really lessen the investment requirement in bricks and mortar. I mean, we've seen that this year through COVID. You know, you have to ask yourself, does it really matter that you can have to be face to face working in an office with colleagues? Well, no. And I think one of the interesting things will be to see how the high street is changing in the light of the online, um, you know, kind of food purchasing. So we're having to reinvent and rethink what are the assets that we have in the high street. Our homes, we think differently about our homes now. Our homes are mini studios, they're conference rooms, they're offices, they're, you know, um, they take on multiple different kind of uses. Uh, and I think that is going to be the key area. I mean, one piece of work that I, that I just finished doing where this was really to the fore was working with one of the lar world's largest cruise port operators. And seeing the transformation that has happened through airports and the user experience at airports and the role of the digital uh, digitalization of security systems, navigation, scanning and so on being now applied into cruise ports and people making the cruise port a destination in itself to the point where they're saying we're no longer gateways to get from one place to another, but we will create a sense of place that will have an inherent value in and around the waterfront. And that actually technology then really is about alerting you to navigating your way through the city, whether that's cultural events or tours, it can offer virtual uh, guidance, virtual experience can allow you to see things that you may not be able to see. I know every time I go to Florence, I get really disappointed because that bit of the UFC is closed or whatever, you know, but to actually create alternative ways of experiencing the city and places through technology, the way that you communicate social media, you know, so you share your experiences. So people don't actually need necessarily to travel, but you can have high quality engagement with a number of people through digital 
and online platforms. And then right down to the innovation that we're seeing in maintenance and service spaces, drones, for instance, okay. perimeter security checks, you know, doing building inspections, doing hull cleaning robots and so on and so forth, yeah. as well as an enhanced security. So there are all of those kind of issues. So for me, it really is about really understanding how these things are going to penetrate and integrate with the way we interact with buildings and cities uh, mediated by technology. So for me, that's that's kind of the one to watch. Thanks, Peter. Matt, let me come to you next. Things that from your end of things, obviously the growth of well-being is a, is a hot topic for you, but what are you seeing that gets you excited? Yeah, I think there's a long, long way to go with shift towards uh, biophilic design, so bringing personalised well-being. Uh, I think we'll see a lot of interesting stuff happening around even going as far as sort of elements of urban agriculture, uh, whether it's sea farms on the rooftop or, or vertical gardens uh, in the reception area of, of a corporate uh, that, that collects leaves every every week and distributes them either to, uh, to homeless people living in the area or to members of staff or whatever it might be. There's a lot of interesting stuff happening in that in that area. And then I mentioned it, but IAQ, so indoor air quality, um, that is only going to become more and more important. I think we're seeing new certification systems focused specifically on that. And the idea of there being a head height CO2 readout in every uh, boardroom or, or, or sort of closed office space, I think will become increasingly common uh, as we go forward. Thanks, Matt. Very interesting. And Sophie? Uh, so I think we're at a really exciting juncture where there are a lot of elements aligning at the moment. And, and whilst there are still lots of challenges to, to getting things done, and in particular, I'm talking about the, the pathway to net zero carbon. I think there's a real determination uh, now to, to get us there and, and the weight of all of the organisations and all of the individuals who want us to get there, I think, uh, shows that that. I mean, there's a long way to go, but I think we're gaining some momentum now, which is super exciting. And I think, yeah, watch this space in the, in the coming couple of years. We're going to see some really, really interesting things happening in the real estate environment. Yeah, thanks, Sophie. I agree with the, the, the sense of the momentum. It definitely feels that way. Buffy, from your perspective. Well, I think we have to win hearts and minds to actually get businesses moving because the, the, the data shows that few businesses have actually moved. That's the reality. So what excites me in terms of the ability to win hearts and minds is the fact that the, the next generation's voice is being increasingly heard, be it through social media platforms or on the, plat on the actual stage in the World Economic Forum where Greta can now speak and stand next to you know, the world's leaders. That excites me because I think that it will take the next generation in the homes, you know, grandchildren telling off their grandparents and their children telling off their parents and saying, why are you not doing more to seeing this on social media and on the stage in, uh, in major, major international conferences. So that excites me. It gives me hope that we will win hearts and minds because I fear that it's not enough to show the, uh, the business plan and business impact assessment and the, the return on profitability in terms of return on investment, but we have to win hearts and minds to really get people to invest now. Very, very powerful observation. Uh, Stefan, is there anything you would like to add on this topic? Yeah, I, I, I'm doing this, this quality management thing then since 10, 15 years. And I've been knocking on doors for, for this decade. And, and people said, well, yes, certainly we care, but no, not really. Um, and the tenants are not interested and, and so on. And this is completely flipping around. This is suddenly it is a big issue. Suddenly we are in the boardroom. We, the issue is on the table. We don't call people, they call us. <laughs> it's changing completely and that is fantastic. I mean, we are a startup, we are doing business in this. It's, it's fantastic. So that it's, momentum is building, yeah. We, we are feeling it definitely, yes. Yeah. And that's of course very exciting. Thank you all very much. Uh, we could have carried on for, for a lot longer. Um, I'm, I'm just, I've kept an eye on questions. We've only had one question through actually, and, I, uh, and you can um, put up your hand if this is one for you. 
Uh, does the panel think that hydrogen will become a widely used method of powering buildings? A very specific question. Does anybody want to comment on it? Does, is anyone in a position to do so? I, I'm happy to make an observation, uh, which is I, I'm not an expert on hydrogen by any stretch. Um, I, I expect it may have a role to play in the decarbonisation of individual homes. I know in the UK there's already some really interesting um, sort of experiments and pilot studies where waste hydrogen from industry is being used to heat homes, I think, in the north. And um, what I would say is for the work that we're doing, um, in the next 10 years, I cannot see hydrogen forming part of that plan. You know, we're very much more focusing on decarbonisation of heat in the sense that we're going to switch away from gas boilers towards heat pumps and, and all electric uh, led heat. So, um, I, I, I'm, yeah, it's, it's not a clear answer. I think hydrogen is an interesting one to watch, um, but I, I think we are still some way off and we just can't wait for that to uh, there's a lot of work we need to do right now and we can't wait for that solution to be ready before um, before we do anything. Understood. Stefan, did you want to add something? Yeah, well, we're doing some uh, uh, well, experiments on that and integrating uh, hydrogen in, especially in low temperature grid uh, uh, supply systems. And that's that's probably an option that, that we'll have. Uh, but uh, it's, it's exactly the type of, of uh, development that we see uh, it's definitely, at, at least at this stage, a very sophisticated technology. And managing it, building it, managing it, et cetera, is going to be quite uh, challenging. And we are right now struggling with all the heat pumps that we, that we are building. Uh, and it's quite a challenge for, for the trades uh, to, to, to get this operating well. Um, and this will be another example. And we better think the implementation right from the start uh, together with the technology. To make to make use of it. Thank you, Stefan. Um, a, a couple of other questions have come in. I'm conscious we um, don't have a lot of time, so um, a brief response, if I may ask. Um, first one: Has COVID nineteen impacted progress in terms of sustainability negatively or positively in the last year? Can I jump in again really quickly? I, I, I think this is such an interesting question. And the way I would describe it, it, we talked a lot about this at the beginning of COVID, how important it was not to kind of sleepwalk out of one crisis into another potentially much bigger crisis. So out of the COVID pandemic and into uh, the climate change crisis. And, and I would say at no point has the determination to tackle sustainability faltered, at least in what I'm seeing from the investor um, perspective. Um, if anything, I think it has been, it has kind of doubled down the determination uh, to, to make this a priority issue. I, can I just add to that? I mean, I, I tend to agree very much. I mean, we we ran um, a series of engagement with local authorities um, who had across the UK, um, England in particular, declared a climate crisis. And the fundamental question was that, you know, is COVID, you know, sort of stifling the oxygen, if you like, from the climate change or weakening the commitment to the climate change? It was precisely that, that question. And I think... Um, I think on balance, the overwhelming answer was no, it didn't. Um, and I think there was an enduring understanding that the climate crisis, terrible as COVID is, you know, when it really bites will be an awful lot worse. Um, and so that, that was a bit of a surprise. The other thing in terms of the survey was that um, local authorities and public sector plan to increase expenditure on on dealing with the climate um, declarations and emergencies going forward uh, and the other thing that highlighted was that they needed an awful lot of help you know so a lot of organizations tackling with a global issue say this is outside our particular legal jurisdiction boundary so the only thing we can do is look at LED lighting, and, but they are desperately keen to work out how they can push out. So people were beginning to say, well, if we've maxed out on what we can do at the level of the building, though I know the panel will say there's an awful lot more to do, they're starting to look at their investment portfolios. How can they use impact investment, even if it's not a direct action around this kind of thing? And then I think clearly 
I think in an odd way, it's given us a bit of confidence, um, COVID, you know, that there's a unifying thing across the world that is actually yeah. affecting everybody. There is quite in an equal way uh, across all nations. And in the same way, that will be the climate change. So I think it's kind of made us think a lot more globally and in a, in a lot more connected way. And I think that will yeah. be really powerful. Yeah, thanks. I, that's a really interesting observation. Um, okay, and I have one more question. We're racing the clock here. Uh, if you have managed, so this is probably for somebody that's been uh, watching the budget and, and sort of chewing over what they said. If you have managed to review and consider the budget announcement in the UK, so apologies for those who aren't that interested in the UK budget, uh, what are your views on the UK's drive to decarbonise our built environment, new green guilt, etc.? Whilst I have not yet analysed all of the detail, I think the general feel that I get from it is, on the one hand, it's amazing how ambitious it is, and on the other hand, it's amazing how much more ambitious it needs to be. And I think that's kind of where we stand generally on uh, on net zero carbon. Is there is it's amazing what's already happened, but we we've still got a significant so much more to do. way to go. Yeah, yeah. But there Don't are, be but disheartened. There are, yeah. Don't be disheartened. So there are, just to add on that, there are real positive signs. I thought the the announcement of the new infrastructure bank and its location in Leeds capitalised with 12 billion. They estimate it will have a leveraged impact of about 40 billion. Uh, that will target and be under influence from the north and the infrastructure needed to connect the north. So a lot of this stuff has been London centric focused. So I think it's terrific if they do follow through, it could have uh, uh, an impact on those areas that are overlooked and that are probably a little bit behind the curve in relation to some of the big investments needed to tackle this beyond the scale of the building so that's good thanks, thanks, Peter. Okay. I think I'm, I'm just I'd, I'd love to carry on talking about that a little bit longer I'm just conscious that we're um, absolutely up against it with time look let, let me take this opportunity to thank you all so much for joining me Peter, Sophie, Ufi, Matt and Stefan um, we could have carried on talking for a lot longer. You all brought a fascinating different angle to this debate. Uh, it's encouraging to see the momentum. We're all feeling it. There is a long way to go. Uh, but as you say, I think Ufi's point, it is about winning hearts and minds as well as action. So uh, thank you everybody so much for joining us. I'm just gonna flip very quickly back. Um, this, as I said, was all part of the Urban Living Festival. And uh, this is the light version, but the actual event is going to take place in July 7th to the 8th in London. Um, and if you're at all interested in sponsoring, please do get in touch with Katie. And that just leaves me to thank everybody else for joining us. Uh, thank you for your questions and for engaging with the debate. And wish you a very enjoyable rest of your afternoons. <laughs>